Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 164, Protoculture, Robotech on the Tabletop. What better to evoke the feelings of Valentine's and Family Day than with the relationship struggles of Rick, Lynn, and Lisa? I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. We record here live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Thanks for joining us, especially those of you here live in our chat room. So tonight we've got a Robotech fan looking to find out what Robotech tabletop games are out there. After diving into that, we've got a review of a two-player abstract strategy game, Aqualin, and finish up with an all-digital weekend review. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. First up, a quick comment from uh, David Fox on episode 162, ElfQuest, nice! <laughs> Thanks, David. Um, that was in regards to our Bellhops tabletop segment where I talked about uh, how Deanna and I finally got the 1980s ElfQuest board game from Mayfair to the table, and I share my initial thoughts on it. If you want to know more about that game, check out episode 162. Next up, Mike Zed commented on our best of 2021 episode to say, always enjoy Riff Raff. I'm not a big dexterity gamer, but the quality of the gimbal in this game makes the difference. Thanks, Mike. I totally agree. Uh, the quality of Riff Raff really does put it above, uh, honestly, almost every other stacking, balancing based dexterity game. And I also love the fact that a big part of this game is actually trying to catch the following pieces, because if you catch a piece, it's removed from the game. So there's actually strategy there of actually trying to make things fall that you're ready to catch. So it's not just about balance. I do dig that. And I've yet to see another dexterity game add that element. Well, Stephanie T sends us a message to say, hey, I thought I'd share. My friend got magical kitties save the day and I went to check out more. Googled review and yours was the first link to appear. Nice. Well, thanks for the heads up, Stephanie. That is awesome to hear. Also good to hear that it seems the game's back in print and available again if you've got someone who picked up a copy. We really did enjoy checking it out, and I still strongly recommend that RPG for families and gamers who are in love with cats. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight's question comes from longtime fan of the show, Red Meeple Ryan, who asks, could you do a show that is a roundup of all the Robotech games since there seem to be so many of them out there now? Uh, yes, Ryan. Yes, we could. And we're going to do it right now. Well, it certainly sounds like we're doing one, so that must be the case. Now, for those of you who don't know what Robotech is, it started as a mashup of multiple different Japanese mecha anime shows that were mashed up, hacked up, and glued back together by Harmony Gold and released to North America on network TV when Sean and I were growing up. Now, Harmony Gold created three different series, and each day of the week, they would show an episode from a different series, which I got to say was confusing as heck. Now, the three series are called the Macross Saga, which told the story of the SDF-1 and Rick Hunter and the singer Min Mei, the Robotech Masters, which was all about a ground battle with hover tanks and Dana Sterling, and the Next Generation, which featured the coolest mecha on the planet, the Cyclones and the battle against the Invid. Now, the thing all three of these series had in common was very cool mecha and the fight over an energy resource called protoculture. Honestly, as a kid, it was confusing as heck trying to figure out <laughs> what was going on, who was who, what the goal was each day. But what you did know was that there were going to be some cool characters, big mecha, and probably some cool battles. Now, after the original three series, Harmony Gold attempted a number of follow-ups, none of which really took off the way the original did. There was Robotech 2, The Sentinels. There was Robotech, the movie, which was only released for home video in Europe. And if anyone's got a copy of that, I would love to see it because I didn't even know that existed until doing research for this episode. 
There was Robotech The Shadow Chronicles, which was supposed to come out for the 20th anniversary, but got delayed a number of years due to legal issues, though you can now find it on DVD. Most recently, there was Robotech Love Live Alive, which came out in 2013. So that is actually the most recent Robotech animation you can find, which is actually a hack of the original OVA Genesis Climber Mospeda Love Live Alive. Now, Genesis Climber was the original Japanese series that the next generation was based on. The cool one with the Cyclones and the Envid. That's right. And if you didn't keep track of it, uh, track of things, don't worry. There are many lawyers out there who have been tracking all sorts of things. Yes, due to the way Robotech property and the license was created, imported and sold to toy, comic book and game companies, there have been a large number of legal disputes over the years, none of which we're going to get into detail about here on this show. Now, if you are interested in learning more about the history of the cartoons and the legal battles, I strongly recommend checking out Toy Galaxy TV on YouTube, who have continued updating their Robotech tales with each new legal battle. You can check out the link below with their newest video on Robotech coming out just within the last six or eight months. All right, let's get to the tabletop games, the actual stuff our listeners care about. So there have been quite a few, but not a lot of Robotech games released over the years, some more popular than others. Now, at this point, Robotech is in no way a dead license. New games and products continue to be released to this day. So what we're going to try to do tonight is give you a comprehensive list of the officially published Robotech games, listing them as close as I could in the order they were released. I will say for some of this, all I knew was what year, so I kind of had put them in whatever order I wanted. Now, this will be a mix of games that are still supported and games that are now long out of print. Though most of the out of print games are still available for purchase on the secondary market and can be found in game stores as new old stock. Now, there may be something particularly out there in the non-North American market we didn't mm -hmm. run into. Again, the legal battles around this series are manifold, so there are certainly obscure products out there. And I've got to say, we did not touch anything that is the original Japanese series. We are looking for the stuff that Harmony Gold packed up and rebuilt, not going back to the originals. So I'm going to start off with out-of-print games. We have probably the most well-known Robotech tabletop game, and that is the Robotech role-playing game from Palladium Games. This was originally published in 1986. Now, for years and years, Palladium had and strongly enforced the Robotech license. They had an exclusive deal with Harmony Gold to produce Robotech content, and that included more than just games. Now, Palladium worked with Harmony Gold to produce the Shadow Chronicles. So the, the first new series that came out was actually a joint venture between Palladium and Harmony Gold. They also worked with Harmony Gold to add to the existing canon of Robotech through their role-playing game and other products. Now, the role-playing game used Palladium's homebrew system, which was originally from the Palladium Fantasy role-playing game, which itself has its roots in D&D. Stats are determined by 3D6, though there's some weird rules where if you roll high enough, you get to roll more and keep adding to it. It uh, uses a D20 for most of your resolution, and it uses something called OCCs, Occupational Character Classes, to replace your normal you know, fighter, thief, and there are tons of them, like possibly hundreds of OCCs over all the Palladium games. Now, this system is possibly best known for introducing the com concept of MDC and SDC which is a damage system to simulate the difference in scale between a personal combat and mecha battles, which is something obviously required for any Robotech style game because both scales happen so much in the series. For years, Palladium was the go-to source for Robotech gaming until they completely lost the license in 2018. It's due to that license ending, most of the other games on this list even exist and why you didn't really see Robotech games or new Robotech games before 2018. And yes, we could spend days talking about the problems of MDC <laughs> versus SDC and so forth, but instead I like to let the system live undisturbed in history for those who love it, and the advances in Robotech canon it brought to us yes. by painstakingly translating works never before published in English to create their game as authentically as anything could be. 
And I will admit, I am one of the fanboys that bought the books just to read them and look at the awesome artwork. So the first non-RPG Robotech product to come out was the Robotech CCG, or collectible card game, back in 2006. This was published by Hero Factory Games. This was a non-collectible two-player card game, which obviously was trying to cash in on the CCG craze at the time. Magic the Gathering being, of course, the most well-known and still most popular CCG out there. Now, there were five decks produced, including a multi-faction starter deck and then other ones you could buy to add to it. 250 cards in total were produced with many expansions planned that never happened. Amusingly, if you go to their Board Game Geek page, it's still written as if they're coming because no one went in to update it once the game died. Now, the game was obviously based on Magic the Gathering with the one big twist, because every CCG that came out at the time twisted it some way, was the ability to use your cards to attack other cards and not just attack your opponent. And along with that, they had an interfence, intercept defense ability where some units could be used to defend others, which I got to say is a good idea for a Robotech type game. They also had rules for transforming mecha. I couldn't find the details on this. I couldn't tell if it was like you play a card over another card or what changed when the mecha ch transformed, but there was a transforming mecha thing. Uh, this game does feature a ton of great looking Robotech art right from the series. Um, this is set just in the Macross series, the original first series. Now I know I tried this one back in the day, but was never impressed enough by it to keep deep diving it. If I can't remember if my dad bought a deck or some one of my friends had it, or even if I bought it, if I bought it, I sold it off. So this one didn't catch my eye back in the day. So despite the name, despite actually being called Robotech, the CCG, there is nothing actually CCG collectible about no. this game. Uh, unless, of course, you step forward in time to where the game has failed completely and you just want some neat cards with great art. Today, it's a collectible, but yep. sadly not for its great gameplay. Yeah, this one's not cheap to go like you. This isn't one you're probably going to hunt out to try out at this point. Now we got to fast forward all the way to 2014. Many, many years later, the next one that comes out, we're back to Palladium and what many consider the biggest Kickstarter debacle in gaming history. So far, I will add that caveat with Robotech RPG Tactics. Uh, this entire thing was a disaster from the start, long before the Kickstarter mess happened, beginning with Palladium stealing the game from another designer, a designer I personally was working with at the time trying to promote their new Robotech game. But now is not the time for that story. Robotech RPG Tactics is a skirmish level miniature game based on the Palladium RPG system it's named after. It was designed to be played on its own or integrated with the role playing game. Now, similar to games like X Wing, there were a series of waves of new mecha scheduled to be produced, um, with many of them never seeing the light of day despite people paying for them. Now, Besides the failure to deliver on promises, this game had many other problems, including the most fiddly miniatures I have ever seen in my entire life that were just Bandai model kits scaled down to 28 millimeter scale, overly complicated fiddly rules, and poor production quality uh, on the required components and boards and cards. Now, I did pick this one up myself because I was curious. I only paid $20 for it. And I honestly don't even feel I got my money's worth for that one. So my heart goes out to those of you who did back this on Kickstarter, especially if you went all in. Um, I have considered at some point in the future trying to live stream me trying to make one of those miniatures. But that probably won't actually happen. But I do think it will be an amusing stream. And we'll have to make sure to turn on that explicit tag if I ever do so. We have the unboxing of this on our channel, and while it's one of our older ones, it's still fun to see how ridiculous this product really is, especially the miniaturized minis. Now we jump forward again to 2018. As I mentioned earlier, this is the year Palladium loses the exclusive Robotech license, and a wave of new Robotech games pours in from other publishers. I will note that as far as I can tell, Palladium has not lost the exclusivity, but completely lost the license. None of the games we are mentioning tonight from Palladium are listed on their website anymore. So you can no longer get them from Palladium. Now, the first game to hit the market, now that Palladium's gone, we got new people on the field, is Robotech Force of Arms. This is from Dave Killingsworth and Solar Flare Games. This is a quick-playing, two-player, math-based games 
where players are maneuvering a grid of ships, capital ships, while playing attacking cards, your fighters, at the ends of rows and columns. Once all cards are placed, the battle is resolved by adding up values on the cards and basically doing a bunch of math on the grid to see who either defends the ship that the, in the cross section or who destroys the ship, depending on what you're trying to do. Now, I've still got my copy of this game, and if you want to know more about it, check out our reviews, either on YouTube or on the blog. I found it to be a quick and simple to learn game, a pretty interesting filler game with enough meat to it to keep me involved. But the Robotech thing really didn't come out all that strongly, and I think it could have been rethemed as anything. A lot of the love for this game comes from the swell of nostalgia one feels from the art on it. The game itself is a solid enough strategic tug of war duel with no real mechanical connection to the content. Not a bad game at all, just not a great game. And I think many will come away feeling it wasn't a Romotech game in anything but its skin. Well, next to come out was Robotech Ace Pilot. This was from Jeff Michlinski and Strange Machine Games and is now being published by Japanime Games, and I'm not sure what the deal is there. This is another quick, easy-to-learn game simu simulating a Robotech dogfight, again, Macross series. Again, Force of Arms, uh, sorry, unlike Force of Arms, this plays two to four players, two or four, sorry, not two, two, four, two or four players. Uh, you're playing in teams, one or two, and is dice-driven instead of being card-driven. What you're doing is you are rolling dice, trying to match the patterns on crew cards that are out there, and each crew card shows an attack pattern. You're then going to apply that attack pattern to a set of tiles in a three by three grid in this like little plastic holder. So there's sticks of stacks of tiles. And then based on your attack, you're going to remove those tiles, and that's who you've defeated. Each character has a different pattern, and that's where supposedly thematically different characters are better at different things. I got to demo this one at Origins. I thought it was a neat filler game but it seemed too simple to me. Like there just wasn't enough going on. Like it reminded me of games like Roll For It with a bit more to it. And again, totally abstract. Like there wasn't really anything to tell me. Like why does Rick Hunter attack in an X pattern and Scott attacks in a T? Like it just wasn't a lot tying to Robotech theme here. Yeah, it's, it's a dice chucking filler, super light, highly random. If you've shared your love of Robotech with your kids, I would actually say this might be a must buy. Otherwise, weigh your options. The nostalgia will wear off. Now, released at the same time of Ace Pilot, or at least in the same month, because I was able to narrow it down, the biggest Robotech board game out there, even to date, was published. This is Robotech Attack on the STF-1. This one is also by Jeff Michlinski, who worked with Darius Hamilton. Uh, this was also published by Strange Machine Games, and again, picked up later by Japanime Games. This is Macross in a Box. This features a full campaign mode with a series of battles occurring around a rather large um, 3D cardboard SDF-1 you assemble. And yes, it can transform to, to a battle tech, battleoid mode. Uh, features all your popular characters. Um, you can get upgraded components for this one, including standees for the characters. There's even deluxe dice. Um, this one is big with lots of components and a price point to match. Now, while I didn't actually get to play this game, I did get a description of play from one of the designers, and I'm not sure which it was, and a short kind of demo of part of a game when I was at Origins the year this came out. So this is basically a tower defense game with various different scenarios you play through. Like in one scenario, different ships will be here. And in another scenario, everyone's on the ship. And in the next one, some of the people are already out in their Veritex and so on. There's also like trying to travel through a minefield. The gameplay in this reminded me a lot of Star Trek Panic, though the designer does claim it wasn't an influence. To me, this is a step, significant step above the Panic games. Like you've got that whole uh, round radar, like around your ship and things moving in, but that's about it. Uh, this was obviously a game designed by Robotech fans for Robotech fans leading into the geeks like lots of minutia and numbers. There's a lot of number tracking and things going on here, dice combat and stuff like this. And to be honest, this one's on my wish list. I would love to try this game out. This looks like it could be really solid and do a great job of capturing that actual Robotech Macross era feel of you're out in space trying to get home. And 
fighting through waves of enemies and all the stuff that made Macross great. I will say that going through reviews and discussions on this game, if you're a Robotech fan, you'll love it. But mm -hmm. if you're not, you might want to just walk away. Fair. It doesn't do anything mechanically original, but it might be the first board game on this list that has actually done some real work connecting the license to the game. I agree. Uh, and just to point out that uh, Strange Machine Games does still list all of these games on their website, but only to point you to Japanime games yeah, to sell them. Sense. So apparently they have the design license, but probably design, uh, determined that Japanime games was a better publisher. source for, as a publisher. Yeah. Well, I think that's it. I think Strange Machine Games was an indie gaming company who got the role-playing game license and published the games themselves. They've now been picked up by Japanime Games, signing some form of license there to, for Japanime Games to publish and distribute, which is a pretty common thing. Like that's not uh, that's that's pretty common in this industry, and honestly, good on Strange Machine Games for pulling that off. All right, moving up to 2019, we've got a number of new Robotech games, and for whatever reason, the people who entered the data on Board Game Geek and trying to dig around, and there's Kickstarters, there's kind of a mess here. I wasn't able to pinpoint the exact release date, so I'm just going to list them in a random order starting with Robotech Crisis Point. Now, this is the second one from Killingsworth and Solar Flare. If you notice, we're going to mention two companies repeatedly here tonight, which is, this This is very similar to Force of Arms, but everything is bigger, including the physical box. Um, this moves on to the second Robotech series, so the first game that isn't Macross. Uh, this is based on the Robotech Masters series. And actually, this is the only game that so far has been published in the Robotech Masters timeline, which I thought was interesting. I, I will admit as a kid, that was my least favorite. So maybe it's it's everyone else's too. Now this game, like Force of Arms, features two players battling with units over a grid, except this time the grid is huge. Um, and you're filling the grid as you play, as well as playing your units on the outside. So you're, you're putting in established stuff in the middle, as well as playing stuff on the outside. And of course, being a card game, there's lots of exceptions moving things around. It's still, though, the end result is basically the same. You're going to end up at the end with the board filled, and you're going to start adding up your rows and columns to see what happens. Now, we played and reviewed this one, and I found it to be much more enjoyable than Force of Arms. There's just more going on. There's more depth. There's more player agency and less randomness. The only issue, though, is that yet again, this is just an abstract math game, right? It reminds me of something published by Rainier Nitzia, and it still isn't very Robotech feeling. And again, for more info, check out our reviews. Yeah, unfortunately, the game also has some ambiguities, some rule yeah. book problems, and other issues that suggest a lack of proper testing. Now, while it's a noticeable step up from its little brother, Force of Arms, it's still a painted on theme. Mm -hmm. And when combined with some of the problems, it makes it a hard sell. Uh, it is notable that uh, most of the forum posts for this game are clarifications from the designer. Uh, and, and what's I, also actually really interesting is Solar Flare Games does not list any of their Robotech games under their games tab on their own website. Oh, well, maybe they've now lost. They talk or about like their the blog license. posts are there, but they're the under the games tab. There are no. So that would have to be a recent change because when we reviewed them, it was from Solar Flare. Actually, it was Dave Killingsworth reached out personally. Yeah, absolutely. So they definitely did when we reviewed the games, and that was in 2019, I think. So. All right, next we have Robotech Brace for Impact. This one comes from a totally new source, Nick Ferris, who worked with Escape Velocity Games and, of course, Strange Machine Games. Again, I think Strange Machine here just had the license, and Nick did kind of took that license, did their own thing. Now, this one's a total outlier. I had no clue this game even existed until doing research for this episode, and you're probably hearing about it for the first time I did. But what we have here is a cooperative party game, a Robotech cooperative party game for up to 15 players that plays in only 10 minutes and that 10 minutes is real time on a timer so you're definitely limited to 10 minutes uh this is again set in the macross era where players are trying to repair the sdf1 right it's it's under attack it's under assault your ship's all destroyed you need to fix it and also fight off the zentradi you're going to do this by playing cards from your hands using a mechanic that to me sounds like happy salmon because you have to match the card you're playing with another player at the table and you both put them down and you manage to do the repair of the attack. Interesting concept. Um, this isn't one I've gotten to try myself. And I got to say, I, 
I don't know, a 10 minute Robotech party game. The only thing that is interesting really there to me is the fact it's Robotech. Though I kind of like Robotech and party game. I don't know what's more disconnected from the license, the abstract math games or the party games. Interesting concept though, and all the power to them. So the people who have played it though, and I am suspecting that they are all Robotech fans, yeah. have loved it. Nice. Apparently there is even a soundtrack that was used at cons that people are desperately trying to get released. The, because oh, wow. those who have used it at the con felt it just really boosted the experience and gave you those feels even more. So if you love that fast-paced, crazy co-op style yeah. and Robotech, this one might actually be for you. And I got to admit, if you showed up and said, do you want to play Happy Salmon or Robotech? I'd probably pick Robotech. All right, our final 2019 board game comes from Strange Machines. So we're looking at Jeff Machinsky and Quinn Washburn. This is Robotech Cyclone Run. Now, similar to how Crisis Point was an advanced version of Force of Arms, Cyclone Run is a similar follow-up to Ace Pilot with more depth. Um, this is the first game that was published in the next generation era of Robotech, which is my favorite era. Now, similar to Ace Pilot, players are rolling dice to activate heroes in order to defeat Invid found on a 3x3 grid and a nice plastic thing stacked up with tiles. Now, I haven't gotten to try this one myself. Um, I am intrigued because Ape Pilot was neat and I felt it was too light. So if this is able to add any more depth, I would probably enjoy it even more. Plus, it's set in, to my opinion, the better series. So I'm curious to try this one out, but I haven't tried it myself. So I don't have much to offer on this one. Discussion on it is very scarce, but I question just how much depth yeah. this dice chucker uh, actually offers. All right. I noted the Cyclone, Cyclone, Cyclone? Why did I put Cyclone? Cyclone, Cyclone Run was our last board game of 2019. I use that wording because 2019 also saw the release of two Robotech RPG products. Now, the first is Robotech, a Macross Saga role-playing game, which was designed by Jason Lang and Jonathan M. Thompson, released by Battlefield Press after a very successful Kickstarter. Now, this isn't a full-fledged RPG with all the rules in the book, but rather a licensed setting book for Savage Worlds. So you're going to need a copy of the Savage Worlds Adventure Edition to be able to use this. Now, I got to say, when I think RPGs and I think Robotech and what two would mesh well together, I got to say, I think Savage Worlds is a good choice, especially for the high octane combats of the Robotech series. And honestly, a better fit than the old Palladium system. That said, I haven't actually played this or read this to know how well it works at the table. There aren't too many settings that Savage Worlds can't seem to handle these days. <laughs> it gets a lot of well-deserved love for its flexibility. Well, next we have the sorry robotech the macross saga role-playing game no this isn't what i just said the last one was a macross saga role-playing game this is the macross saga role-playing game unfortunately yet again we have multiple companies trying to compete to be the real robotech game now the macross saga role-playing game seems to me to be more of a follow-up of the old palladium system with some significant mechanical changes now it's by brian young and jeff Michinsky. Uh, name I'm going to keep saying all night, multiple times. Uh, it is published under Strange Machine Games name. Now, it uses a proprietary Advantage 6 system. Now, this is a skill-heavy system that is much more reliant on skills than stats, than statistics. And based on the reviews I was able to find on this, reviewers are finding it a little hard to grok, a little hard to grasp and figure out with lots of questions. And many people are saying that it's actually much more complicated and crunchier than the old Palladium system. That said, lots of people do seem to be enjoying the artwork, the background information, and getting new Robotech content out there for the first time in many years. See, and it's interesting because you and I were very obviously reading very different review sites uh, because go. I got the feel that this is actually the biggest struggle people are having converting from palladium to this is that this is more of a modern game it okay. is more of a narrative game and a lot of the crunchier fans are not dealing well with the shift from crunch to narrative now i don't think it's a full full-on pbta style narrative right. but it is moving in that direction 
which I think has led to some un- discomfort in there. Uh, but I, yeah. I, I am assuming that, okay, people have been calling it crunchy and hard to learn and difficult and they can't grasp it. Also does sound a lot like how I felt with fate when I first read it. So it Holy is fair. possible that someone who's used to rolling 27 D twenties and then 36 D sixes to hit with their missiles could find something like defining an aspect and using a plot point complicated. Absolutely. And I mean, the, the lack of distinct, um, you know, Oh, my skill is three, you know, yes. that that's something that crunchy people know and understand and say, to say you have a skill and you're going to roll and ask questions afterwards is, is a tough, a tough, yeah. you know, it's a paragraph. Yeah. Uh, so honestly, I feel though for the real serious Robotech fans who are RPGers, this mm. one might actually be a must buy. Uh, they have been developing Southern Cross and in inv- invasion material for the game. Now, this is where things get weird because apparently the Savage Worlds team is as well, which leads again to this confusion that there seems to be one license holder. And, I, and I, as we've been talking here, I've even been doing more research and more research. And it's really weird because Japan Anime Games isn't actually selling any of these games we've been talking about them selling. Um, for some reason, Japan Anime Games doesn't have any Robotech games on its website at all. I, the Japan, okay. I, again, <laughs> maybe it changed over COVID. Uh, I yeah. have seen these games at the Japan Anime booth, yep. no, and I have been offered to review them from Japan in, Anime Games. In 2018, they released a press release all about how they were going to be selling these games. Yeah. And that is the only thing on the Japan Anime Games website that comes up when you search for Robotech, is that press release. Um, what I, there is, there is a robotechgames.com Sorry, robotechboardgames.com. Oh, that's new. Okay. Which is a Strange Machine Games site. So I, as far as I can tell, Strange Machine Games and Harmony Gold and at one point, Japan Anime Games got together and there's a license involved there. I, I think Strange Machine Games is the official license holder who has mm-hmm. been subletting the license to other groups, specifically... Um, Escape Velocity Games and the team who worked on Savage Worlds. So it seems to be sort of a, a, a here's Harmony Gold up here, here's your uh, um, Strange Machine Games, and then they're letting other people dabble and then into Solar it to Flare around. somewhere in there too. Well, except Solar Flare no longer mentions it on their website either. Yeah, so so, <laughs> so I'm looking at a copy of Robotech Attack from the SDF One, which has an MSRP of seventy nine ninety five. Remember, I mentioned it was expand. Yeah. expensive i've got the sku here it says publisher japan anime games yeah it's just interesting that it's not on their website yeah that's odd like i am looking at um i, I will provide an affiliate link for this in the resources but uh right stuff anime is a great source for these robotech games they have right. most if not all of them um including an awesome bundle where you can get everything for the defense of the stf1 including a neoprene play mat and everything yep. for 100 bucks which is actually a significant discount but again everything here says japan anime games right like and like if i look up cyclone run cyclone run i shouldn't be doing this for the the section <laughs> of the show but i'll do it quickly i see harmony gold i see japan anime games at, right on the box cover yeah it's just interesting japan anime that games it's so not- i don't know on their website so there's there's some strangeness um i'm sure it's a yet another legal dispute over absolutely i mean it's gone on for ages but literally when you go to japan anime games and type in robotech into yeah. the search results the press release for defend the universe with three games is the only thing <laughs> that comes up from 2018 so the licensing and legal battles on this uh, for this license have not yet ended <laughs> Well, we don't. We can't confirm that there is an ongoing legal battle, but there's definitely people arguing over who is the the rightful owner. In a way, I'm I'm not sure if there or, are any the, actual the current shifting lawsuits. Like, not necessarily, but but shifting licenses. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. Putting that aside, uh, maybe in the coffee break we'll do a little bit more research. But putting that aside, let's move on to the next game. So we're we're going to do a jump here to 2020. Not all that long ago. Um, this is the time of COVID. So, of course, the Robotech releases are almost non-existent. Um, most of these games are coming from small indie publishers who got hit hard by uh, everything going on. I'll just start with that. So there was only one Robotech game published in 2020, and that is Robotech Invid Invasion. 
now we're back to Solar Flare and King Killingsworth again. Um, unlike the previous two games that were obviously based on the same system and evolution, this is completely new. Um, the only thing similar is you're dealing with cards. That's about it. There is a lot more going on here. Here you are taking on the role of the next generation rebels battling against the invids set in the next generation series. Now the game's broken into two acts. The first breaking through the line to get the crisis or sorry, not the reflex point. And then the second actually defeating the invid Regis and her forces. Now this is done uh, purely co-op. So this is the first purely co-op. Uh, actually a defense SDF one is also co-op. So I can't say the first. The pure, first purely co-op game from Solar Flare, whereas the other the other company had done a co-op game. Um, where you're working together, it plays up to six players. So except for the party game, we're looking at nice big high player counts, uh, card-driven, dice-driven, three different stats for each character, four different forms for each mech, lots of dice chucking, dice rolling, meeting allies. This, to me, is the Robotech fans game. This felt like playing through an actual Robotech adventure. And this one we did review. So again, if you want even more detail, check out our reviews on the blog on YouTube. Indeed, I think this was the first to actually bring solid hobby gaming and the license together in a meaningful way. The defense of the SDS-1 was a little closer to, the, to, to mass market than hobby, whereas this is absolutely yeah. hobby game. Now, moving into last year. There were two Robotech games released, the first being a miniature skirmish game called Robotech Macross Dogfight, the miniature game. Yes, nice long title there. This looks to be like what everyone wanted and expected from Robo D Robotech RPG Tactics. Uh, you've got miniatures here that don't require ex excessive assembly. Yes, you had to put the arms and stuff on, but you're not like building little transforming mechs. Um, it features modern mechanisms, You've got um, elevations and you've got some kind of flight pass system that I got to say reminds me of X-Wing or Wings of War. Uh, honestly, every picture I found of this game looks great. So I am a little confused because I can see it for sale right now at the publisher's website. Uh, the publisher here is Kids Logic, which I'd never heard of before. And But then you go to their Facebook page and it's all about a Kickstarter. Now it is listed as released in 2021. So perhaps this Kickstarter is for a North American version. I'm not sure. I will say this one has me somewhat excited, but looking at those components, this is not going to be a cheap game. I, it, it looks high end. I just hope it has more success than the last Robotech miniature game and people actually get the final product in their hand. So uh, for price wise, this is listed at least on their website as 70, 70 US MSRP. Well, that's honestly not bad for what uh, I saw. Apparently, this did get to backers in 2021, uh, but not many people, or at least not many people who are board game geek users and talked about it. Right. But there were people getting their delivery in July of 2021. Uh, this new Kickstarter is apparently for more content, maybe, which okay. is strange because no one is talking about their old content. Uh, I downloaded for the rules for this and started flipping through, but I'll be honest, I am not a miniature gamer. And as they started talking about battle platforms and elevations and connecting the flight paths between platforms, my eyes started to glaze over. Fair so enough. they do appear to have some neat stuff there. And as a collectibles company, I expect solid quality from their minis. Yeah, all the pictures of the minis I saw were like, that. those of them are Robotech miniatures I want. That's what I want to see. Yep. Now our final game tonight, is Robotech Reconstruction. This is back to the Macross era again. Everyone loves Macross Robotech. I think it's because they later bought the box sets and that's how far they were able to get through in a row before their eyes started bleeding or something. Um, this time, this is from a Dr. Wix and again, it's published by Strange Machine Games. Now, despite Board Game Geek listing this as a 2019 release, I can't find anything out there for this besides a pre-order site. Now, this looks completely different from all of Strange Machine's other games. This is a coin game. Yes, a counterinsurgency war game set in the Robotech universe. In Reconstruction, you have four competing factions, each with their own goals and victory conditions, based on nine very specific episodes of the Macross Sagra that happened after the first Robotech war, when Earth is undergoing reconstruction after losing 90% of its population, when the Zentradi are starting to 
be mixed in with the human species. This one promises to probably be the heaviest role playing or sorry, Robotech game out there. And I got to say, it looks pretty good, especially when compared to these other games. So it looks like a lot more work went into the design and layout in this game. I got to say, I am impressed to see the evolution from Ace Pilot to this, like just the, the, the progression that Strange Machine Games has gone through from very simple, light, mass market almost games to a coin game. I got to say, to me, as a gamer, I like seeing this progression in that publisher. Absolutely. So apparently three days ago, they released pictures of the final production proofs of this yeah. game. So, so there's think, no way it's published. So I think this is the one that has just been stuck in quarantine. Um, I think this is going to be a great game for a certain group of gamers who really dig the coin games and also happen to be passionate about Robotech. As mm -hmm. someone who's not solidly in either camp, I don't think this game is for me, though. So I'm going to say now that Root is as popular as it is, people aren't as scared of coin games as they used to be. And I got to say, this looks more Root level than, say, uh, Fire in the Lake or one of the other bigger GMT coin games. So that's it for the officially published and licensed Robotech games out there. Now, in addition to this, the Robotech fan community is a very creative bunch. And you can find Robotech hacks for a ton of different RPGs out there. And there are some board game hacks as well. There are even some unlicensed full games out there, like the Macross 2050 role-playing game from Kamui Shuro, Robotech Skirmish from Warp Spawn Games, and the new Robotech role-playing game, which at least sounds different from the others, which was published in HTML on GeoCities and can still be found out there through the Wayback Machine. That's not to mention the plethora of mecha games obviously based on Robotech, like Firebrands, Mobile Frame Zero, Starship Samurai, and Lancer. So if you love your Robotech, no matter if you're a light, fun gamer, RPG lover, or a hardcore hobby gamer, there's certainly something out there for you in the Robotech universe. Now we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. If you've got a question for us like Ryan, all you got to do is head to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or hit me up on social media where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Welcome to our review of Aqualin, a two-player abstract strategy board game. Aqualin was designed by Marcello Bertucci and published by Cosmos in 2020. Features artwork from Sophie Reka Rekasowski. Uh, this two-player abstract strategy game takes minutes to learn and under half an hour to play. Aqualin has a nice low MSRP of 1995 US. Now, it's also worth noting that Aqualin was nominated for the 2020 Golden Geek Best Two-Player Game Award. Have you played Aqualin? Listen in to see if we think it's a solid game or for the fishes. So the extremely pasted on theme of Aqualin has players trying to manage groups of sea creatures with one player trying to group them by color and the other trying to group them by type with points being awarded for groups of two or more once the board's filled. One of the things that stands out about this game is the really great quality of tiles, which you can see for yourself on our Aqualin unboxing video on YouTube. Now, these tiles are Azul quality, though not nearly as colorful. They all come in the same color, blue, featuring one of six animals and one of six colors on each of the tiles with an equal representation of each. The game also comes with a board that's honestly nothing more than a 6x6 grid to place your tiles on, and very clear and succinct rulebook. Simple enough. Well, now that we know we'll have an idea, but what you get, how about you tell us how to play Aqualand? So Aqualand's very simple to learn. I'll teach you the entire game here in probably under a minute. One player plays species, the other player plays colors. You mix up all the tiles face down, then flip six face up. Starting player picks a tile and places it somewhere on the 6x6 grid board, then reveals a new place. Going forward, each turn, players have the option to move one tile that's on the board orthogonally in a straight line until it hits another piece or the edge. They then place a new tile from the face-up ones onto the board and reveal a new tile. This continues until the board's full, at which point you add up the points. 
Each player scores points for each group of orthogonally adjacent tiles in their type, again, species or color, with two tiles being worth one, three tiles being worth three, four, five, five, ten, and if someone managed to get all six matching tiles to touch, they get a big 15 points. That's it. That's honestly all there is to it. Nice and easy to learn. So what did you think of this tile lane game? So Aqualand is one of those easy to learn but difficult to master abstract strategy games. The rules are dead simple, but it's not until you actually start playing and specifically start sliding pieces around that you realize how much depth there really is here. In that way, Aqualand has a very chess-like feel where players will be trying to plan multiple turns ahead while playing the game. So be warned that because as well as moving pieces, your opponent can pick and place a tile that you planned on pacing. Mm -hmm. As a result, too much planning will re result in wasted effort when they yeah. place the tile that you wanted somewhere completely different. So remember, there are only six tiles face up for you to pick from. So it's not necessarily the chance that they're going to steal that one pink fish you wanted. And so far in all the plays I've been part of, this has never been a problem of anyone picking the tile I wanted to place, but rather placing tiles where I don't want them to be because they block things, or more frequently moving a piece I don't want them to move that was already on the board. Over multiple plays, though, I have learned that my long-term plans were often broken very early in the chain, like one or two turns in, and I've had to adopt my play. Now, in this way, Aqualinit ends up being more of a tactical and a reactionary game than a strategic one. Now, I wouldn't specifically say this is a bad thing, but it helps if you know this going in. I personally would have preferred a bit more strategy, though I don't see how they could have changed it to allow for that. So I think this game benefits from those who are able to think and more importantly, rethink strategy on the fly, as opposed to those who plan far enough with move trees, you know, the whole chess thing. Exactly. Now, physically, the game's top-notch. Um, I really dig the look and feel of the tiles, and I love how small and portable the game is overall. Now, Deanna and I are always looking for games we can bring with us to play at places like coffee shops and brew pubs, and Aqualin is going to be perfect for that. The only real problem, as far as portability is concerned, is the board, uh, the 6x6 grid, and we've been considering getting some type of other version to use, like a neoprene mat, maybe, or a mouse pad with a six by six grid on it. And then we can use this for this game, but also the Duke, which is another two player tile lane game we love that also uses a six by six grid. Indeed, there's certainly nothing special about the board. If you frequent restaurants with crayons and paper tabletops, you could draw it out and you'd only need the tiles. Krabby Joe's for Aqualin at 6 p.m. tonight. Now, a surprise to me with this game was actually how much my oldest daughter enjoys it, perhaps because she was, up until you yesterday, completely undefeated. Since getting the game, it's become a favorite for Deanna and Gwen to play together. They both enjoy it significantly more than I do, and it's not that I don't enjoy it myself, it's just that they're loving it more than me. For me, it kind of sits below Onitama, the Duke, and Patchwork on my two-player game ladder. And honestly, three down is not a bad place to be. Yeah, I, I think I would probably put it above Patchwork, but it's not quite at Duke level for me. Only fair. Now, one complaint I do have, and it's a minor one, is the choice of iconography and the theme. Like, really, the theme makes no sense. Like, uh, I, I don't quite understand how the theme even applies. And well, in the middle of a game, it's not easy to see at a glance what's what. And I honestly think the gameplay of Aqualink could have been improved if they used geometric shapes instead. And what keeps coming to mind, and I honestly think there might be six shapes and six colors in it, is Quirkle. As opposed to these kind of artistic angular fish and crabs that we have. Yeah, it, this one is an interesting thing. And I read there's a lot of uh, discussion about this. A lot of owners complain about the subtlety of the graphics and the bright lighting helps with the play. Okay. I actually think that this was a deliberate aspect of the game. Okay. The game makes you think about color and shape in a specific way that would have been reduced if you made it just more obvious. Uh, you get into that, um, you know, you look at the word red, but it's 
the, it's, it's written in green and you Remember, have to say yeah. the color of it. And there's a little bit of that brain work that's going on in this game. I think, I, I think that was deliberately implemented okay. by the designers. I could see that. So overall, our family's really been enjoying Aqualand since we got it. Um, it's a solid addition to our stable of two player games. Great looking, quick to learn, and has that difficult to master thing going on, which honestly is a magic combo for any good abstract game. Got the bonus of being small and portable that will make it perfect for gaming at pubs and cafes, as well as breaking out at home. If you're a fan of two-player abstract strategy games, I don't think you're going to go wrong picking up a copy of Aqua. Now, if you're looking for a thinky filler that's great for two players and simple to teach new players, this would also be a good choice. If what you love about abstract games, though, is the long-term planning involving looking three, four, five, and six turns ahead, you may find Auckland frustrating as the board state changes so frequently. You may just love it, though. So here, I think I leave this one up to you. Maybe seek out a copy to try or play before you can buy. Now, if you are looking for a very cool thematic underwater game where you're controlling Words of fish, I, I, this isn't it. This is this is purely abstract. Um, one of the most pasted on themes I've ever seen. Um, like I get schools of similar animals gathering, at least one player, but like animals of the same color gathering together, that's, that's too much of a stretch for me. As noted above, I actually think I might have liked the game more if it just used geometric shapes and just went, look, we're an abstract, deal with it. Finally, if you're not a fan of abstract strategy games, chess-like two-player games where you're trying to outmaneuver your opponent, I don't think Aqualand's going to win you over. Though, with the really flat and short learning curve, if you get a chance, try the game out. Maybe it'll win you over and you'll be surprised. Well, that's it for our review of Aqualand from Cosmos. When you have time, I invite you to also check out the written review over at tabletopbellhop.com. Now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. So with both of us being rather busy this last week, uh, neither of us had a chance to play an actual physical sit-down game this week. So what I think we're going to do, so we don't just skip over the whole segment this week, is take a look at the games we've been currently playing online on Board Game Arena, which I'm going to start with Lost Ruins of Arnak. Now, we have two concurrent games of Arnak going, uh, one with three players, one with four, and I got to say, when the three-player ends, I think I'm not going to start a new one. Just wait for the fourth one to send. And the reason for this being, it's hard enough to remember what your long-term plans are in that game or what you got those resources for last time um, that I think playing online, having two games at once, like it's bad enough with one game. With two, it's just like, wait, what the heck was I doing? Um, overall, though, I still say this is a fantastic implementation of the physical game. Um, when played real time, which we got in not a full game, but at least a bunch of turns in a row, it really speeds up the game compared, compared to playing physically. Um, I honestly don't think there's anything really missing that the physical game provides other than the fact that it's just more fun to play with people in person. So I got to say those components are really nice. The, the tactile quality of especially like the arrowheads and the, and the tablets does add a bit to the game. Though I do say I personally missed the teach from an in-person yes. game. <laughs> Fair enough. So uh, first up, I got Haggis. I have had a three-player game of Haggis going on repeat <laughs> since I started on Board Game Arena. So like wow. three years, maybe longer now. Um, it is just a light, fun, and yet infuriating game where you think you've got it all figured out until someone drops a combination that you weren't even, you didn't even remember you could put together a drop on the table uh, because it's just so rare that you ever get that combination of cards in your hands. Uh, but no, it's, it's just, and you don't really need to think ahead all that much because it's all open and all, everything that's been played is there. Everything in your hand is there. And, and the rest of it is just uh, looking and, and you actually even know what, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, crown cards, your, uh, royalty cards, your, your opponents have left. So it's all there to work with. So it's just trying to find the best combo you can and, and plan to guess that social interaction of, okay, well, I know they have this, this, and this, and I know they've done this, this, and this, should I play high or should I play low, which is going to get me out sooner. 
the 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 hands of cards having sets reminds me a lot of trying to play mahjong yep. when you're playing with people who know mahjong yeah, yeah. Uh, or more so for us it was playing various computer versions and having them suddenly throw down a set of tiles and i'm like what is that <laughs> We got a question from the chat on this one. Is this a trick taking game? Yes, Sagus is a trick taking game. So it, but well, it's how do you end up with combos with a trick taking? Well, it's it's you're you're so you can start off like it all depends on what you play. So you can play like a single card, you know, by okay. number, uh, or you can play uh, doubles or triples. But you can also play runs or uh, doubles and triple runs. Or there's also a um, a specific set of uh, three, five, seven, and nine. If they're all different colors or all okay. the same color, that acts as a sort of uh, you know stop everything end of the thing. Or you can play use the royalty as either um, you know a, a, a fill in card or on their own two of the two or more of them as a sort of stop everything. There's the, okay. It's it's, it's the, there's a lot of intricacy to it. It's it's not just uh, you know your simple. Uh, well, as, as you can tell, I have not played Haggis. <laughs> Sounds more like a ladder game than a trick taking, where you're trying to play multiple cards and trying to you're vacate your hand. Yeah, so every, it goes around until everyone is passed twice. Like everywhere, everyone is passed. Interesting. Um, so I'll, I'll have to look into that one a bit more. Yeah, the three of us should play uh, sometime. Next, I've got Zolkin, uh, which I can't believe we're still playing. Because, like, I don't think everyone playing the game has even figured out quite how Not to play yet. Close. <laughs> Which I find very amusing. Who are you just um, in negative right now? I don't even know how you get in negative. I, 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 if you have to beg, if you don't have enough corn or you can't feed your people, you go into negative points. Um, plus, if you get bumped down on the god tracks instead of up, you can get negative points. Uh, this one I'm not a huge fan of online. Like, it works. But, like, I am good at Zolkin, and I love the physical game, and I keep making mistakes. And like I have never had to beg or or get negative points. And it's happening here. And I'm like, I don't even know what I did last turn that I now have negatives. Like somehow I'm missing something with the seasons because there's two different there's two different types of seasons that go by in the game. And one ends the game, and like on the blue ones, you score one side of a track, and on the brown, you score another. And playing physically, for some reason, that all clicks in. And I think it's just the spatial thing because there's so many things with the gears moving. I don't know. I, there's something that like I played terrible on there. Like I'm still having an okay time playing it and I'm enjoying it. So every time it ends, I hit rematch. And and surprisingly, the other players, especially some that are doing pretty badly, keep jumping back in. So it's still going. <laughs> but I'm kind of like, why is this one? Why are we still playing this one? I guess everyone must be having fun. Maybe we should invite you to a different game and it'll have a better <laughs> time. I, I get very amused by his chat messages, like 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 starve, starve you all. <laughs> It's pretty fun. Uh, what it's really making me want to do is play physically. Like, like I, the other thing is like, Sean's got to come down and try this because I have the expansion that makes it asymmetric where you have different tribes and the tribes have special abilities. Plus there's a whole nother God track added to it. And I'm like, I've only actually played the expansion once. And I remember thinking this actually made it better. And I always liked Zolkin. Like to me, Zolkin is still my favorite of the tea games from boards and cards. Well, but yeah, why, why we're still... If learning it would help too yeah that's one of the well, yeah you'd where, actually learn I, didn't I, you play it down here physically? no i've never played uh, never oh, okay. played physical the interesting thing the one thing I, I i think i'm actually getting it now we've played it enough times and i'm starting to figure things out and I, i'm, I'm sure you're doing, getting sections of it. i'm not doing as badly i, I still keep missing out on I, I on how you get collect all the corn that's on the big main wheel Oh, there's one spot that takes first player. It's off to the edge of the board. It's not yeah. on one of the wheels. And I thought I'd keep using it, but I don't seem to ever get any corn. So I don't under there's something I'm missing. But I don't know. I, I don't know. When you take first player, you get all the corn on the wheel. That should be it. Yeah, I don't know. But maybe so, you're not getting all it because there's a variant where the designer thought that was overpowered. Mm. So nerfed it so you can only get X amount of corn. Yeah. I maybe we're know. playing with that variant and I missed it. Or or I'm missing something when I when it happens. I don't know. But you know. yeah. Uh, next up, uh, I've been playing Splendor ever since they added it to. I don't know what can you say about Splendor. You either love it or you never want to play it again. Um, I still enjoy it, though uh, not playing it in one sittings has its drawbacks, as with everything on Board Game Arena. I wouldn't mind joining it on there. I'd probably rather play it there than in person again. 
Next, we come to Azul, which right now for me kind of feels like it's our new Seven Wonders. So anyone that's been listening to the show over the last three years knows we have been had been playing Seven Wonders over and over and over again. I think logging 90 some plays by the by the time someone didn't hit rematch once and I've been out and I'm kind of glad uh, we played so many games of that. Now, now Azul start to feel like that, but not in a bad way. We haven't gotten to that point, but it's just the game that's constantly being played. Um, we take turns often in short bursts with like three or four in a row and then finish up a game or it goes weeks before we take turns. Um, Azul on BGA is perfect. Like, like I honestly, uh, it's not a social game normally. Like there's no real bluffing or social interaction needed to play Azul. So it being purely abstract on board game arena, like I don't feel I'm missing out anything. Like I, this isn't making me go, oh, we need to play together in person so get the real experience. No, I feel I'm getting it perfectly with BGA. And uh, I wrote this yesterday before I won our game. So that's, that's <laughs> not impacting this because I was going to add, and it'd be nice if I won sometime, but I finally won a game last night. Yeah, no, I, t- uh, I, you guys, you guys finally started paying attention to me uh, and have been uh, dealing out punishment to me for winning the first couple of games. And uh, it definitely took its toll. So I, I do I do like the uh, I do like the implementation, and I love the fact that I don't have to score. I hated scoring yes. as well. I just hated it, uh, and I, I feel I, like along with possibly bumping your score marker and forgetting. <laughs> that I, I feel like things. I was always scoring wrong in Azul. I just always yeah. felt that way. So it's nice to do that. Um, it would actually be interesting to see if the other Azuls come to BGA. Uh, to see if we like them better without you know that way. What I want to know is, can we flip the board to the other side? Uh, I don't know. Like that's base game rules from the original. It'd be interesting to play the other side because we have now played enough games that I'm like, I wouldn't mind a little bit of variation or throw in the wild card tiles. Like if you can do any of that, I'll have to look at it. I'm usually the one hit and rematch. So (laughs) Um, there's got to be a way. Deanna's talking about how to see how many tiles are still left in the bag. I I wonder if there is a way to see that anywhere. I'm going to have to look at that next time we play because it's not something I know. I am not paying enough attention to that. Knowing, you know, what colors are not possibly even in there to come out for next round is kind of important. Uh, so for the record, uh, 72 games of uh, Seven Wonders on my list. Oh, there you go. Uh, 132 games of Sushi Go. Three hundred and twenty one games of Can't Stop. Yeah, I, I, I did the <laughs> two games you had to play to one or whatever. Two games I had to play. I think I did two because I made a Golden Blight account and then I made a Tabletop Bellhops would be branded account. Right. So I played the Can't Stop toys. All righty. Um, so next up, uh, I've got Deus, which I'm yep. actually starting to understand. Uh, turns out I should have scrolled down more during my first play and I might oh, have understood okay. it better. But ever since you told me it was an engine builder, which I literally played an entire game. Yeah, I don't know how knowing. you could play that, not knowing you were building up a card tableau. That's because gonna the make card chains. tableau was down and you had to scroll down. Yeah. Uh, things make way more sense. Feels like a totally different game. So you played that so much more recently than I am. I'm like, that's one. If you come down, you can teach me to play because <laughs> I haven't gotten it off my shelf in years. And it's one of those games I want to play once more and either keep it or not. And I have a feeling it's going to be a play it and keep it once I play it. Right. But we'll see. Next, we've been playing repeated plays of Tapestry, which has been awesome. Um, big thing I've noticed, though, is a lot of people when this came out complained about the factions being all over the place, totally unbalanced. And playing physically, uh, which we played it six, seven times before we did the review. So it's not, not a small amount. I could look that up. But I was like, yeah, but they fixed it, right? Like they put out this PDF and and my copy of the game can't actually own had was new enough. It had the most recent balance sheet and it seemed good enough to me. But what I'm seeing now, it's not that some factions or are better than others overall. That's being fixed. The problem is some factions are way better or way worse, depending on what other factions are in play. And Honestly, I don't see how you could fix that without like a board game arena could probably do something to fix it. But like for the physical copy with here's a sheet of exceptions, I don't even know how you fix that. Yeah, I mean, honestly, you'd have to do the random draw. And if X comes up, discard Y. Yeah, like these two factions shouldn't be played together. Yeah, like the one that one I got with with D and it was like, oh, this, this looks interesting. And then D started the game and I'm like, oh, I can't. This faction is completely utterly useless now. I don't. So care Sean had that. a faction, 
where he got a bonus for being ahead on the tracks, whereas Deanna got a faction that started her at level two on all the tracks. Level three, like, even like, I think. I don't think it was level two. No, it was level two. It was level two. Okay, but yeah, it was. Level it was just like tracks. it. It just completely crushed my hopes, basically. Yeah, you're like <laughs> my faction is useless. Yeah. Um, but even even other factions, like even in our game right now, I'm playing the military faction. She's playing the isolationist. I can't ever attack her because right. she always plays two cubes. And meanwhile, she attacks me. I can't even fight back because she plays two cubes. I'm like, what yeah. the heck? And as Deanna points out, you don't see what other players pick. You even see their choices. I, I'm sure they do. Can you well, look at what the other players' two choices are? Because that, that actually might balance it. Because you're like, oh, they might choose that, so I won't choose this. I don't think you do. Like, yeah, if no, you're playing physically, we always played them as a hand, right? You didn't see. But I'm like, that might be the fix. Is if you could see what the other players have to pick from, you could you still have to do that weighing. Are they going to pick it? Or are they not? But right. you might be like, I am definitely not playing this against any of those factions. Might yeah. be a good host. And then I I misread my sieve. Well, um, that happened. So <laughs> I, I I thought it was if I if I filled a square, but it's actually if you fill a square with all the same houses. Yes, um, Jeez, that was the first faction Deanna ever played. And I and it, and, and I didn't. I missed the with all the same houses yeah. part and that it's I mean I, I'm not gonna fill a single square now because I of I was messed up I did. But anyway, it is what it is. Anyway, uh, I'm good implementation. It. The yeah. the complaint here is actually about tapestry, not yeah, yeah, about no, the BGA version. <laughs> absolutely. Uh next up, sushi go. Uh two, <laughs> sometimes three games of this going at once. This one this one plays well online. You can glance at everyone else's played tableau, and even if you don't recall what cards you've passed on, you're still probably going to make solid choices just based on what you've played and what you can choose and what everyone else has up. That's one I didn't enjoy much in person, so I never actually had the urge to try. It was too light for me in person, but like it's supposed to be one of those, you know, beer and pretzels yeah. chatting. It's yeah, happening absolutely. while you're doing yeah, yeah. other things. Last one I've got for the, uh, the last little while is Castles of Burgundy, um, which is up there with Azul as uh, a game it seems like we're going to be constantly playing. And I don't mind at all. Um, this one, I honestly think the board game arena version is better than the physical version. This is a, a better game. Uh, it removes all the fiddliness and the icon referencing and looking things up in books. Um, what I'm digging is we're at the point now where everyone who's playing seems to be about the same skill level as about the same experience level. And we have had some really close games and really enjoyable games because of that. The other thing I got to say, though, our current game, my gosh, did I choose a terrible board? What was I thinking? Like, I, and I started in a dumb spot. Like I have all fives around me and sixes. I'm never going to fill those. I don't know. That was that was my own fault. We finally, I, I changed the rules so that we now, instead of doing the, we, we played with the, everyone gets the same board. And then we played with the like one, two, three, four, five. So everyone gets a set board. Then we went to the draft two and it included the expansion boards. And yeah, I think, I think I made some bad life choices at the beginning <laughs> of this game. But honestly, I don't know if I'll ever play my physical copy again. Uh, like, Jeff's like, asking if the BGA version is okay for learning. Uh, you know what? I had never played castles before this. The first playthrough was pretty rough, and I, I I didn't know what was going on. But I think by the second, like after talking with Mo after the first game, there were, there were a couple bits. There were a couple missed. of things like, oh my god, I had no idea. That's yeah, no you idea. Guys you scored, scored for completing areas, yeah, or well, yeah, it was that the, you know the round scoring things for completing areas. But once that, that uh, but but once I once I got a couple of those little things that I'd missed, um, it's right on board again. That's how I I'm more used to learning things yes the tool tips are fantastic yes the if biggest you... thing is put your mouse over the weird looking building and know what it does instead of having to grab the book and look it up yeah no i i i'm i'm still gonna want to learn all these games in person i think sometimes like even arnak I'm, i've played it three times now i still want to learn this again in person yeah there I might be something teach. you're missing there um because I there's there's just little di like th details that i picked up today when i was sitting staring at the board i had some time down from work and i had like nine games i needed to play so when when Garnet came up, I stared at it for a long time and was was picking up a couple of things. I'm like, oh, oh, I don't think I really realized that before, but that makes more sense now. So, uh, next one for me is Go Nuts for Donuts. Uh, this is very similar to Sushi Go. I was gonna say very uh, similar, right? But it's this prisoner's dilemma 
aspect. So it's a standard market for everyone to choose from. You play your choice face down until everyone has played their choice. Then you flip it over. If two people have asked for the same donut, nobody gets it. Okay. Uh, cool. only, you, the only time you get a donut is if nobody else asks for it. That sounds like it needs in-person gaming, though. Like, I'm going to play a brown. Like, that seems like that would be a big aspect of that game. Uh, see, I don't really necessarily think i said i don't think the social deduction needs to be in person because you're looking okay. at you can see everyone you can ever you can see everyone's donut hand so every right. when you get a card it's what there in have. front of you so you're like okay this person has been heavily leaning towards going for this kind of card over and over again over the times and you know right now they have this and they might do this uh it's i i'm finding a lot of the sort of logical analysis of okay. of a hand now if people aren't playing logically, you're, you're SOL, but that's, that's, uh, yeah, I, that's, that sounds like a very group dependent game, honestly. And it's fun because there's, there's some people who it, it took us a while to really kind of pick up on the strategy. Every couple mm -hmm. of games, someone finally types, types in the chat. Oh my God, I've got it. And I finally got points now. <laughs> oh. and, and all of a sudden, and that person kicks into their gear and it's just like, there's eight, I don't know how many players is it quite a, six players, maybe. Um, yeah, I don't know. And every once in a while, someone else clicks in another level and it, it just it sort of evolves a little bit more and and, and uh more people it just gets better because more people are, are grasping it at that level that's one that got a lot of buzz a lot of podcasters like that game but I, my my limited game budget and literally game timing i'm not a big party game fan. no absolutely not. so it's, i i wouldn't it's not I wouldn't something i'm going to seek out that's that's one I'm, i need i need public play to open up i need someone to bring it then i need to enjoy it then i need to pick up my own copy if i enjoy it as you as you can tell by what we reviewed in the last year compared to what we reviewed three years ago <laughs> there, there's definitely a more of a focus yep all right well how about a look ahead what do you have planned for the coming weeks so i do have two packages here one massive heavy one that i will be opening during the after show and well that honestly will probably dictate some of my upcoming gameplays or at least what i'll be reading now right now i will just tease that you can expect some rpg content ringing in sometime soon now this weekend we should be getting together actually confirmed we are getting better back together with tori and cat um which may or may not involve us starting out charterstone like i i really I can't decide. Like we we've had Charterstone long enough. I feel we need to do it, and it is one of the few games left on the pile of obligation. But I also haven't seen them in a long time, and I kind of want to show them off. Like like they haven't gotten to play Arnak or Underwater Cities, uh, or a lot of the games I got for Christmas yet. So we'll see. Um, my big plan though is to get in a few more plays of Chronicles of Avel with the kids. I'm hoping to be able to review that next week. Um, if not, because I know the kids are looking forward to going to visit. Um, my in-laws i do have other non-obligation stuff i can review because at this point i am certain i played enough games of lost ruin of arnak to be able to review it the only thing i need to do is try that snake board at least once because it does sound like it may fix some issues i have with the game so that might happen this weekend too so Torian cat we'll see um what's in the box does mean we may be doing some unboxing videos so i uh, head over to youtube click the surprise button ding the bell get notified when i don't know that's on twitch sorry Twitch. I record that right here on Twitch. <laughs> Same thing. Hit subscribe, ding the bell, follow. Sorry, follow. There's no subscribe. You can subscribe. I like that better. Do the thing so you get notified when I go live. And I'll tweet about it too. So even if you don't do the thing, but I like it better when you do the thing. Now a quick shout out and thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. David Miller Jr. Thanks, David. No, I probably should really edit this so that like we just call you Dave or Math Guy Dave or Bike Guy Dave. It seems kind of weird that I still have this like formal, but that was the name you signed up as. That's still in the notes from like that first week. Brian Kurtz. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Jeff Seuss, who happens to be in the chat. That wasn't planned. And Sheila, too. Thank you both. Kevin Reno. Thanks, Tech. Having fun at work, I'm guessing, tonight or, or having to get up early. Yep. Timothy Smith. Thank you, Timothy. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we get to the part of the show notes where every week I think we got to change that for next week, and we don't. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find your podcast, find our podcast on your podcaster of choice. You might you find, probably yours find yours, too. too. 
<laughs> and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. If you sign up for the newsletter, you do have to verify. That is Canadian law now that we have to follow. You have to get an email from us and click the link in the email to actually sign up. So please do so. And our last burst of subscribers, less than 50% verified. So I think that's not people trying to get away with anything because it's not like we have a giveaway going on or anything. I think it's people who legitimately want our newsletter but aren't realizing that there is unfortunately a verification process that we cannot skip. Now, if you do like the content we're providing, you can get more. All you got to do is go to patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop, donate a little bit of your money, you know, cost of a cup of coffee, as I like to say, to help us keep creating content. And I'll be sure to give you some cool bonuses like additional audio and show notes and other cool stuff. Access to our Discord. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us. Be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show and stop by on YouTube Sundays for brunch. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And And game game on. on.